Good evening and welcome to the Ombudsman program. My name is Diane Wellborn. I am the Ombudsman and I'm going to be your host for this evening's program. I'm very pleased to tell the viewers this evening that we are going to spend this program focusing on the condition of epilepsy. And I'm very pleased to introduce to the viewers my guest, Lisa Hansen, who is the Executive Director of the Epilepsy Foundation of Western Ohio. Welcome, Lisa, and Thank thanks you. so much for coming on the program. Thank you, Diane. I, I appreciate that so much. Um, before we dive into all the questions and, <laughs> and things that we're going to discuss here, can you just give us a, a layperson's uh, definition of, of epilepsy? Absolutely. Um, you know, epilepsy is a medical condition that produces seizures, and many people know that. We like to refer to it, though, as an electrical storm that happens in the brain. So um, when a person is said to have epilepsy, this is when a person would have two or more reoccurring seizures. So they, they will have seizures over and over again. And so in that case, that is epilepsy. All right, that is epilepsy then. Um, your area covers a, a fairly large region, Western Ohio. Mm -hmm. what, there's a number of counties that are included in, in your foundation's territory, aren't there? Yes, we, we actually serve 11 counties, okay. and to the west and to the north. Um, you know, uh, I'm not sure I can Na name. <laughs> you don't have to name all of them. I would have had to have but, a cheat sheet. Yes, but, but it's a, it is it is a pretty wide area. Um, what what is your estimate or understanding of of the how many persons that live in your area um, have the condition of epilepsy? Well, you know, the Center for Disease Control actually changed our numbers. Oh, they uh, did? Uh, yes, uh, about two years ago. Mm -hmm. And so numbers that used to be 1 in 100 are now 1 in 26. 1 in 26 people that will have developed epilepsy in their lifetime. And so we have actually taken a look at our service area, and those numbers translate to about 48,000 people. Right, that's a, that's that, a significant mm -hmm. number of persons, isn't it? It is, yeah. yes. Yeah, good. Okay, um, what, uh, you mentioned that, that there are two seizures, and, uh, and then, then a person may be diagnosed or may have the condition of, of epilepsy. Can you talk to us a little bit about how diagnosis normally occurs? Well, you know, the, the only visible symptom of, of epilepsy is a seizure. But, um, you know, and sometimes, you know, when we, we know about the tonic-clonic, and that's typically the shaking seizures, people are familiar with that. So it would be more obvious that you would want to see your physician if you have that type of seizure. Um, the other kinds of seizures, though, can be more difficult to diagnose, and that a lot of times is in the onset of children, but they are absent seizures. So they can be a staring seizure. So somebody may be talking to you, and they actually might just stare off just for a second, and you may not really be aware they're having a seizure. Sometimes people aren't aware themselves that this is happening because they have no recollection. So those can be a little bit more difficult to diagnose. Um, diagnosis happens through, of course, talking to your physician, and a lot of times they'll run an EEG, which is a, a brain test. Uh, blood tests may be involved, sleep studies where they monitor overnight. Um, we encourage folks to journal if they feel that something is, is not right or strange, because sometimes people begin having seizures and they don't have family members to observe and to, to help them through that process. So those are some of the things that help physicians to diagnose or those tests that we talked about. Oh, that's it. And what was the name of the staring seizure that you mentioned? Absence. Absence. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's uh, and, and where you're just absent for that brief uh -huh. that brief just moment. Absent for a second or two mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. and then that, that goes away. Um, are most cases, are most cases, most conditions diagnosed in childhood? You know, the highest occurrence of diagnosis is in children and in seniors. Okay. Actually, uh, more than 300,000 uh, children under 15 have epilepsy. And there are about 200,000 new cases diagnosed a year. Mm -hmm. That number is very similar in seniors. So there are about 300,000 seniors nationwide, and it's actually the most growing, rapidly growing population of people with epilepsy. Really, is the senior, mm -hmm. the over 60 population yes. that you're talking that about? That is then. correct. Okay. Um, are there, um, uh, are, do you feel that there are 
enough folks trained just in the general population uh, as far as teachers or aides or helping folks that can help recognize um, recognize these seizures in children? Well, you know, this is probably one of our biggest concerns right now is that we feel there is a huge need for training um, and training that needs to occur with the general population, training in businesses, in schools, um, in long-term care facilities. Uh, we have a huge program right now to train our school nurses and so we provide CEUs in those training courses so that school nurses have this knowledge and can take that back into the schools and to help train the teachers and we also provide then training for the administration. We even have a training program for the children and for the classroom um, which we can maybe get into a little bit later but sure. yes training is very important and not only in the general public but we have a program that trains our emergency responders and our first responders, it's very important that they're able to recognize what is a seizure and maybe not um, a, a drug overdose because sometimes those are confused and you can see why it's so important for them to know to recognize seizures and to understand that first aid piece. Is it uh, common for any kind of ID to be worn once a person does have a diagnosis so that um, emergency personnel might recognize this? Is that something that people sometimes do? Yes, yes it is. Okay. And, and even through our foundation, we help to connect them to companies that provide different types of ID bracelets. They even have some now that, that can securely store medical records. Oh, I see. If necessary. Well, so very sophisticated. Yes, yes uh -huh. it is. It is growing in sophistication. <laughs> You're right. Especially with, you know, electronic medical records now, um, that can be very helpful on site to know what medications they're on and, and how they can be best helped. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about about the different types of, of epilepsy. Um, uh, you've, you've mentioned a couple already, the tremors and then the absence, but let's talk a little bit about the various forms of, of epilepsy um, to inform the viewers what a broad spectrum you're, you're really dealing with with your foundation. Well, you know, um, there, uh, in, in terms of epilepsy, it, it can vary by individual and we don't really have a direct cause. There can be many causes um, for epilepsy. Rarely it is caused by genetic, a genetic, genetic connection, but there are some like Dravet's syndrome that usually there is a genetic factor. Dravet's syndrome comes a lot of times on in childhood and the individual can have a hundred or more seizures a day. So it's a lot more difficult to manage Absolutely. these. And you know, there are some newer forms, um, when I say newer, they're being recognized um, that, and, and I, I, I actually, there's a couple of them I can't even pronounce yet. We're just learning about them. But in one case, it's very, very early in childhood, sometimes even in the womb, that epilepsies begin occurring. And this particular form that I'm just becoming familiar with, the child can have 300 plus seizures a day. But like I said, that is very rare. Right, right. Um, um, so they can be, I think it's it's in that intensity and the, the number of reoccurring surge, okay. um, seizures that we have that changes those various forms and we do refer to them as syndromes. Well, I will probably come back to that a little bit more, but I'm being told that we have a caller that would like to ask a question. So I'd like to uh, hear the caller's question, please. Thank you for this uh, very interesting uh, show. I was struck uh, by... I'm uh, sorry, but we're unable to hear that here on the set. Thank you for this very interesting show. Now we hear you. Thank you. Go ahead. I was struck by the statement of your guest uh, concerning the number of children that suffer from epilepsy. And my, my question has to do with the uh, prognosis, the possibility of uh, improvement or even cure uh, and the resources for that in the Department of Ohio. Well, thank you. I think that's a very uh, broad and encompassing question, but we'll do our best to get you an answer. Thank you for calling. Okay, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, 
Cure, management, okay. research, what's it? <laughs> well, I tell you, we work closely with the National Epilepsy Association, uh -huh. and they are working very closely and, and feverishly on funding research. That is, you know, first and foremost, find a cure. Find those treatments that help us to manage epilepsy at its best. Most epilepsies are managed with medication successfully and especially you know in children so once you find that that right balance of medication children do very well you know it's it's some of those rare forms of epilepsy that we've talked about that can present more challenges and so um, you know I would say that right now of course we want we want to find a cure right we don't have a cure all right are there certain centers uh, or places where more uh, that are are very involved in the research. Are, are there John, yeah, John, John Hop Hopkins, Hopkins, Hopkins University is okay. very involved. Um, many of those centers they work closely with the Epilepsy Foundation of America mm -hmm. to really you know find out what what do we need to be researching, you know um, what do we need to be focusing on. I mean current targeted initiatives focus on the cognitive and psychiatric aspects, health outcomes, morbidity and mortality. They're working youth women and severe symptomatic forms of epilepsy like Dravet syndrome. Right, right, which we will come back and talk about a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, are some of our fellow citizens within the territory of your foundation participating in research trials or is there something going on locally that you would want to tell people about? Well, we don't have any initiatives right now. Mm -hmm. We do um, have close relationships with our physicians and our neurological institutes here in the area. So we work closely with them on any projects where we can invite clients to participate in mm -hmm. research and, and really be an assistant to any, any research projects that would be going on through their initiatives. Um, occasionally we are asked from nationals to provide a survey and we involve our clients in that way um, and if there's an opportunity for them to participate on that national level we get the word out and try to connect them. And uh, w back to the caller's question and to something that you said before the the number of, of children that are diagnosed with epilepsy um, and you mentioned medication is the primary control. Um, talk to us a little bit about what that means for the children that that you are um, serving, that there's a, a an education for them and their lifestyle and their activities. And tell us a little bit about what what that looks like when you when you work with people managing this condition. Absolutely. Well, you know, a lot of times if a child um, is newly diagnosed, the families will reach out to us. So we work with the whole family um, because I think that, you know, the diagnosis of epilepsy has an effect on the whole family and everybody needs to work together to support one another. And we work with the parents. And this can be, depending on the age of the child, uh, this can affect their schooling. So when we're talking about medication and treatment of epilepsy, um, you know, there can be some emotional imbalance as they're beginning to adjust to the medications. So we want to work with the school staff and we help them to provide um, a seizure action plan mm -hmm. so that there's a plan in place should there be a seizure in school or should they be changing medications or adjusting. We want everybody to be part of their education so they can have the best education possible. So that is always very helpful. And then, you know, a lot of times we need to bring that educational piece to the schools. They may have never dealt with a child that will have reoccurring seizures. So we will, that's when we involve the school nurses. Uh, sometimes we provide that individual education plan support. And we'll meet with the teachers and the administration and the school nurse and the parents all together to come up with the best plan for the child. So some of your staff are are available and skilled at helping a family negotiate that with a teacher and it, it, it can it can help with that. that well correct. good we will come back more to what what your uh, what your your staff uh, do for us. Want to kind of go back to the caller's question a little bit about about uh, research. Um, are are those of you involved in, in helping find a cure and helping those that have the condition live well and, and manage it, um, are, are you at this point satisfied with the amount of resources that are being devoted to, uh, to working with, with epilepsy? Or, or well, do you feel it, it really needs a lot more funding and attention? 
I think it needs a lot more and funding lot more. and attention. I do, and I think they're making great strides uh, with our national office, and they're learning to use all of our wonderful media tools to get the word out, and they're working on grants and building collaborations. But I think you know there's a lot that we can do, even in our communities and as individuals, to you know guide those resources towards research. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. very, very good. Then, um, can you say a little bit then about the, um, are, there, are there certain activities that particularly maybe children, uh, middle-aged and seniors might need to avoid um, when they are uh, living with this condition? Does it change life in, a, in any ways that you would want to highlight for us? Well, I would like to emphasize that individuals can live very well with epilepsy. You know, Good. most epilepsies are treated effectively with medication. And of course, you know, there there is a, a large percentage of individuals that do have difficulty and it can affect their daily living. And some of those things that can be affected are driving. You know, you are not to drive if you're having seizures. And right. so, you know, we make sure that we work with folks to make sure that they're managing their epilepsy. We want them to take their medications so that there are no breakthrough seizures. Um, because you do have to be seizure free for six months before having driving privileges. So that's an important piece. Um, you know, it, it can affect, there's a lot of stigmas yet attached to epilepsy. And I think that, you know, even when we talk about the education piece or living with epilepsy, I still hear time and time again about how people don't understand epilepsy and what it is. So they're afraid of it. And so a lot of times people don't feel they have the support or can talk about their epilepsy. So I, I think that that's still a big factor for individuals. And that's one of the reasons we provide child um, education in the classroom to help them understand. The most important thing you can do is, is know what's happening and be a friend and be supportive. And you can teach that at a young age. And when we dispel those stigmas at those young ages, that carries over when they become teenagers and then adults. Right, right. So we hope to change that in this generation. But you know, uh, there, there are things. Sometimes some of the barriers can be affording the medications. So you know, we work with families to help them find prescription assistance programs. We, we have a program ourselves for an emergency assistance program. You know, so those are, those are some factors. Um, sometimes job, job changes, you know, navigating through that, that job search piece, that can be challenging. And, you know, talking to your employers and, and having a plan in place. Because mm -hmm. one would need to have that same plan available in the workplace that That's you describe correct. about having available in the, in the school setting uh, as well. That's yes. Correct. Now, are there particular uh, medications that are uh, uh, that are commonly prescribed because they are effective or? Uh, you know, there are, the, there is a list of medications and of course it's very individualized mm -hmm. and we do see some commonalities which I will, you know, if somebody wanted to call into the foundation we can certainly talk about that and, and we are familiar with some of those medications. Um, but of course their physician is, is the best course of action to discuss of those. Of course, of course. And um, uh, talk to us a little bit about what are some of the most common requests that come to you and your staff at, at the foundation. I mean, what, what do you all hear the most on a daily basis? Well, our, actually our medication assistance program brings in a lot of callers. Okay. You know, a lot of times people find themselves between um, insurance or an insurance situation. And, you know, you can't go without your medication. So it's very important that you continue that. So our program helps them with that. Then, like I said, we, we take that further and we follow up with them and we make sure that they have a discount program or we help get them on uh, additional assistance that would be more long term. Is so this that's very from important. some of the pharmaceutical companies that provide yes, sometimes it, yes, assistance when people prove that they are unable to to, yes. to manage that. Yes. Okay. So yes. you are you're a navigator for the for people on that. Okay. We are. That's we good. are. And you know we are a general information and referral service. So if we if we don't have the answer, we will help individuals get the answer. But you know a lot of times, just in terms, another thing that can be a barrier is that transportation piece. You know, so to help individuals navigate through the transportation because if they can't drive, you know, getting bus assistance or making sure that, you know, they have those, that transportation in, in place is very important. Um, we get a lot of requests from families. 
seeking support, seeking information. Um, a lot of calls lately on the education piece, yes. you know, navigating through the individual education plan and how to deal with the first aid in the classroom and, and working with the school nurses and the administration. We get a lot of calls in that area. Uh, we get a lot of requests just on first aid education for seniors. Uh, you know, we're working um, right now with a couple of nursing homes, long-term care facilities, and providing that piece for caregivers. So, you know, really we provide that education to any organization that may have experienced an employee or a volunteer that has had seizures and now they say, we want to know, right. we want the knowledge. And we think that that is so important and wonderful when they reach out to us that way. Right. Is your um, schedule for training um, uh, in individualized? I mean, are you, are you all able to send somebody to an employment setting, for example, to do this so an, an employer that might be viewing this program would, if, 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 if they need that, would be able to contact you and have someone set up a time and come and, and do a session that yes. would help educate? Yes. Okay, and then when the families want it in the schools, the families would contact you mm -hmm. again to set up a time that's convenient for them and your staff and the teacher and kind of do all of that together. For, right. That's almost like an individualized care plan, really. It really is, and yeah. you know, when it comes to the families with children. We always ask that we meet with the family and we get an appropriate history of what's happened and mm -hmm. uh, we want to make sure that we have all of those pieces together and that we've got a relationship mm -hmm. built with the family so we really know what they want to accomplish by our meeting with the school mm -hmm. first. Good, mm -hmm. good, that's great. Well, when was your foundation established? Well, we were established in 1974, so okay. we're in our 40th year. Mm -hmm. And um, the foundation was uh, started by Mrs. Joan Shrek. Okay. Uh, love, she and her husband, Bill, are just a lovely couple that are still involved with the foundation. And uh, they have told us so many wonderful parts about their history. One of the things that she shares often, I know she wouldn't mind my sharing on the program, is that, you know, when they met, if you had epilepsy, you couldn't get married. Is that right? Mm -hmm. oh. So, you know, going back, uh, there were a lot of stigmas attached, and we've made progress, you know. Certainly. But um, they lived through a, a lot of things navigating life with epilepsy that we can't even imagine now. It was even more challenging mm -hmm. than, than what we have now, exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the uh, we spoke a little bit before we came on the program tonight. Um, would you like to just offer for the viewers just a simple uh, comparison somewhat in, internationally? I mean, are we in the U.S. more, do we have a higher prevalency of epilepsy than some other areas, or just how, how do we stand, you know, in the, in the world view? Well, and you know, we have, we use a, a number of two, approximately 2.2 million Americans that have epilepsy, and that number comes from between 1.3 and 2.8 million. So they just take a median and we use 2.2 million, mm -hmm. but there are about 68 million people worldwide that have epilepsy. You know, I, I don't know a lot internationally, I'm mm -hmm. learning, but what I do know is, of course, um, in the developing countries, um, there seems to be a higher prevalence of people not living as well with epilepsy, and a lot of that is because of the cost of medications. Um, these medications are not inexpensive, right. so, you know, I think that that, that is a factor. A barrier for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. But as we gain more international knowledge, of course, those are things that we are learning about right. every day. Does the uh, Epilepsy Foundation have an international component? Is, is it an international, do you have an international body? Well, you know, we have the Epilepsy Foundation of America, but right. there are other foundations and organizations that, you know, are, covering that, that mm -hmm. are covering that, uh, that as well. Um, do you all provide, or does someone else in our community provide um, what might one might think of as support groups. You've said a lot about the individual tailored approach um, with with children and then with seniors and developing an, a personalized care plan. But do you do people get together as groups and talk about management issues and resources and talk to us about that? You know, yes, I, really the support element is so important and we do have ongoing groups that, that meet, but one of the things that we are learning about is the social media. People are coming together through social media and we 
have been in touch with folks that have been in social media groups and su epilepsy support groups from other parts of our county, and that's how they've met. Okay. And they come to us, and I've gotten to know, you know, this this family from up in New Bremen, and I live here in you know Dayton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. So that's that's been that unique piece that we're seeing that they're finding that support online. Well, that's a very good thing. But mm -hmm. through that, what what's happening is they're learning about our foundation, and so we have some new opportunities that provide that support and some social therapies that we're very excited about. So what happens is as we begin to engage families mm -hmm. um, that desire the support groups, we'll bring together a new support group for teenagers, that, you know, for instance, or for parents with children. And a lot of times we'll also provide informative workshops for them and provide child care. So you know, we, though we have those standing groups, a lot of times we have new groups that will evolve out of those relationships. What we're seeing is some of them evolve from the social media. Oh, that's really it's interesting very and a very good thing. It that is. People can it is. get linked and find one another um, through, through all of that. Um, are there, uh, I can imagine that your support comes from a wide, a wide base, but are there either particular professions or or, or organizations or maybe even businesses that you would like to give credit to for, for really supporting um, the, the cause of finding a cure for epilepsy or supporting the, the families that are, have the condition? Well, you know, um, we have several fundraising events throughout the year, and we are very grateful to our supporters, uh, corporations, we local corporations and businesses and individuals um, have been wonderful in supporting us, you know, each and every year. Um, we have companies that provide in-kind services and just provide those volunteer, skilled volunteer pieces that we couldn't function without. So, you know, the list goes on and on and, and we, we do feature them, you know, each year at every opportunity that we can and we are so grateful. Um, most of our, our funding comes from individuals and from fundraising at this point. Okay. Yeah. And what, uh, what are your um, events that you have uh, coming up in <laughs> the next, uh, whatever time period you want to use? the next well, six months, the next year, whatever. Well, I will tell you, you know, I've been with the foundation about a, almost yeah, a year and a half yeah. now, and so the, our signature event is Mud Volleyball. Mud Volleyball. And just about everybody I talk to knows about Mud Volleyball. Yeah. It's very exciting. I experienced my first one this last year, and it is an experience. Right. <laughs> it's wonderful fun. We draw almost 5,000 people each year. That's great. Over th I'm sure. Oh, I, I, and I'm over 300 teams come out and play, and you do not stay clean. <laughs> no, well, you're not supposed to with mud volleyball. That's no, great. So that's very and how exciting. does that? How much does that translate into as far as a, a fundraiser generally? And do you have a goal? Always have a goal to make it bigger. I know, but you know. well, you know, um, in very simple terms, it provides about a hundred thousand dollars of support that's fantastic for programs and services and um, we really are making an effort this year through our events to let let folks know what programs that their dollars are supporting mm -hmm. and so you know this year one of the other things that we put into place is our flame walk series and so we are trying to in, you know really encourage our communities to engage in the training and the awareness piece and raise those dollars but to come together for epilepsy right. learn about epilepsy let's and talk about the concept of the flame a little bit with mm -hmm. respect to your organization yes well the flame is our logo yeah. our national logo and then of course we're an independent affiliate so mm -hmm. we adopt that same logo um, but you know we want to believe that we ignite a flame of hope Okay. And so with our Flame Walk series, that's exactly what we want to do. And we like to say, we feel we're on fire yeah, right now. Oh, oh good. You know, now, where, where was, where's the MUD event and, uh, and when is that coming up? So well, viewers can be thinking oh, about yes. it. Well, the MUD Volleyball event actually takes place the second weekend in July every year. So uh -huh. um, I actually, mm, I hope I have this right. Oh, <laughs> July 13th, I believe, is it'll be 2014. Yeah. It will. Everything yeah. is on our website, if I may. Please. Make a plug for that. It's yeah. www.ohioepilepsy.org, and you know, Good. please visit us. We have wonderful information, and it connects to our national organization as well. So, it can answer a lot of questions by visiting. Mm -hmm. But um, it is uh, the actually the registration will launch April 1st, and people that are 
mud people, yeah. you know, they know that. Mud but volleyball, okay. Yes, uh -huh. yes, because they've got to get that special course. With 300 teams, that's incredible. That must be something to say. Where does this take place? It takes place at Wergerson Gardens, mm -hmm. and uh, we've had it there every year, and we work with the city of Dayton. is wonderful. They partner with us to help provide that area. So, Good. Uh, you know, we're very grateful to the city of Dayton for that. And how can people participate in the Flame Walk? Well, we actually have uh, two walks coming okay. up, and we're, uh, we're excited because this last week we were able to secure um, Dayton Dragons Field for our local walk, which will take place on May 3rd. Wonderful. So we are going to have it down at the Dayton Dragons Field, and we are thrilled uh, with that collaboration. That'll be a wonderful place. It for will walking. be, yes. Right. And our another part in our Flame Walk series, and this will actually be a bike ride, but this will be um, held in Miamisburg. Oh, good. And we organize an event in our Flame Walk series to help a child obtain a seizure dog okay. each year. So we partner early with the family. Uh, we partner with Four Paws for Disabilities for abilities, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and then, so this year, it will be a bike ride. Good. And it will be sort of a bicycle tour, so we're excited about well, that. bikes are big in Dayton, so you should have good. <laughs> uh, I've been told we have another caller, so okay. thank you very much for calling in. You're on the air, and we'd love to hear your question. Yes, I was struck by the comment of your guest that uh, the medicines to treat epilepsy are expensive. And uh, I'm wondering, are there programs in the school uh, in Ohio to uh, provide financial resources for children uh, from low-income backgrounds? And uh, I'll take my answer off the air. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for that good question. Lisa, I'll let you... Say a little bit more. You've talked a bit about the resources, but say a little bit more for, for children. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, most actually most children can obtain coverage, and there are there are those resources in place. So most of our prescription assistance um, that is provided is for adults that find themselves in that that gap of insurance or you know in those situations where they need that assistance. So you're seeing that the children are are for the most part then covered through one form of insurance or another, yes. either public or, or private through parents. That's correct. And it's, so there really aren't, aren't programs through the schools per se, I right. think was his question. Right. And okay. so th we don't see that there's a, a large need for yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So it's really the, the adults that, mm -hmm. um, well, that's... And from time to time we will have, you know, um, for families that they have that medical coverage. So we do from time to time have a parent call that said, you know, this is a one time, something happens with the deductible, something happens right. with the insurance. So we will provide um, some assistance in that particular gap, but it usually is resolved pretty easily. Okay, very good. Did you say all that you needed to say about the bike, about, about the biking event, or did I cut you off? Oh, <laughs> well, you know what, we are just, are, are really excited. Yeah. Um, this event will uh, benefit a little girl, Emmeline. Okay. Uh, she's seven years old, and she's just delightful, yeah. and this seizure dog is going to bring you know a, a lot of light to her life well so we're excited about that opportunity to partner with this family well that, that's wonderful have um, I, I know we're going to show a clip a little bit later that's going to show some of this in action but tell us a little bit about seizure dogs and um, how frequently are they used how long have they been used where do you find them, where are they trained? Just tell, tell us viewers about how, how that works. Well, and you know, I, I do not consider myself an expert by any means, mm -hmm. but um, we actually learned a lot about seizure dogs and how they can help individuals. And Hold that, we have yet another <laughs> call. I'm so glad people are calling in though. Um, yes, you're on the air, we'd like to hear your question. Go ahead, please. of people with epilepsy have service dogs? I'm sorry, could you repeat again? I heard you say service dog, but I missed the first part. What percentage of people with epilepsy have service dogs? Well, thank you. Now we've got it. Thank <laughs> you very much. We'll go back to what, get her question answered. What percentage have 
uh, seizure dogs, and then we'll go on and talk a little bit about more about what these dogs do. Do you know, I really don't have the answer to that. Okay. Um, but um, I, that is an answer that I would like to research and, and know myself. So we will look into that, and I would invite the caller to please reach out to us at the foundation and we will, we will try to get that answer for you. Okay, so we'll give the phone number now and then we'll yeah. give it later. What's That's your phone wonderful. number? Our number at the foundation office is 937-233-2500. Okay, but are serv uh, seizure dogs, service dogs becoming more popular? Is this, is this an increasing trend? And well, you know, I think that they, they have been popular okay. from what I am learning. Um, I don't know exactly how many people have them. It is easier to obtain a seizure dog for an adult than for children. So uh, Four Paws for Abilities does a, a great job in helping to match dogs and train dogs for families with, with children that have epilepsy. And, and there are other, um, other conditions that service dogs are appropriate for as well. Uh, but they can help because they sense the seizure. They can, they can sense that it's going to happen. So in some cases, like the little boy that we helped this last year, the parents aren't sleeping at night because he's having up to 100 seizures a day mm. and they happen at night. So the parents aren't getting much sleep and this right. dog is trained to alert the caregiver mm. that the seizure is, is about to happen. So right. that's an example of you know, how they can really benefit an individual that has epilepsy or seizure disorder. Okay, and uh, are are these dogs? Do you know? Are they trained around here locally, or do they come from far away? <laughs> well, many of them are from different areas outside of our state, but okay. Four Paws for Abilities happens to be here in our area. They're at, based out of Xenia, Ohio. Okay, well that's mm -hmm. good to know. Mm -hmm. So they're they're busy training uh, training dogs to help families uh, mm -hmm. with this. Then that's great. Um, I also wanted to um, uh, to ask generally the number of of families or persons. I'm not sure how you keep count, but you've talked about the number of people in our in your 11 county area. How many people a, a year or a month are you all serving? However you count it. Well, you know we we actually. We keep track of the number of calls that we do get in, but of course, the number of calls in follow-ups, a lot of times, you know, that's, it, it depends. There would be several interactions with the family. We hope ongoing. We always say, once you're in the family, you're there. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, we can have, um, you know, about 12 to 1,500 calls a year. Okay. Those that initial, you know, phone right. call, right, um, and that connecting point. So people looking for information or assistance, or just to get connected with others, or just for inf general information. Okay, so mm -hmm. that you all are busy. And how large is your staff? Well, <laughs> we not have, large enough, probably. <laughs> this is true. We we say we are small but mighty. Okay, good, good. <laughs> and and you know uh, we have a lot of volunteers that enhance what we do. Oh, that's wonderful. So you know, we're very dependent on our volunteers, but we we have actually a core staff of four, okay. and that includes um, a development um, manager. Mm -hmm. She helps us with everything from programs to training to our events. Mm -hmm. um, we have a finance manager that also helps us with everything. We all wear many, many hats. Right. Uh, we're all ready and able to do whatever job we need to do, and they are all trained in working with our clients, but we also have a community educator, and uh, she is actually a paramedic, and she has epilepsy, and she's been with us for many years. It does a fine job training in the community. It sounds like she's probably a busy lady with all the trainings that you that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular um, one particular need that the fa your foundation has right at this time? If there's some viewer that wants to is moved to, to make, make offer some help. What, what do you need most? Well, you know, we are always looking to engage volunteers. Okay. We, we have a need for volunteers, everything from answering the phones to helping us with mailings to helping with events to engage with the community. So that's always a way that people can help. Um, we 
also use, utilize volunteers when we have our fundraising events. Okay. So that's, you know, for something like Mud Volleyball, we have about 250 volunteers. Yes, it's a big event with yes. all those balls and all that mud. Yes, <laughs> so, you know, if an individual is not sure what to do, that's right. a place to start. Um, we, are, we are always raising funds. Yeah. It's always a, a challenging task to be mm -hmm. able to fund everything that we do. Okay. So we encourage people to learn about epilepsy and engage in the events, um, get involved, you know, come and see what we're doing and, and, and help us out. That's wonderful. Um, thank you for bringing with you a, um, a short video that we're going to uh, play here in just a few minutes. But Lisa, would you like to introduce it for us and then we'll ask the staff to run it. I would be happy to. Uh, when I first assumed the role of executive director, I received a phone call from uh, New Bremen, Ohio. A little boy there, his name is Oliver, um, was diagnosed with epilepsy and the family had moved up from Texas and um, they were seeking seeking support uh, because you know here they were in a new place and they had this new challenge and um, lovely little boy and to just sort of fast forward through that um, that community gathered around them worked with us to have a flame walk and it had been recommended for this little boy to have a seizure dog so we worked with Four Paws for Abilities to be able to do this for this little boy, but also to provide you know, that much needed funding for the continuation of the education programs and, and services that we provide, um, and to bring that training piece to that community. And so they came together in a way that was so moving. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, they, it of course was our initial flame walk in this series, and they even brought together luminaries to light that pathway of, of hope. Oh, that's a nice it was, touch. It was really beautiful. It was real, we had bands and we had a, a bouncy you know, things. It was a, just like a festival. Right. So it was a very exciting time, and I am happy to report that Oliver is graduating with his seizure dog in June. Oh, well, that's very good news. It is good well, news. Well, I think we'll ask, uh, ask the, the staff here to please turn it on for us so we can see the title is Ol Oliver's yeah. Walk. Well, it is Oliver's Story. Oliver's Story. Mm -hmm. When Oliver was three months old, um, he had his very first seizure. It was a normal day, everything was perfectly fine. You didn't think anything was gonna happen and then all of a sudden, he just tensed up and he started to seize. Oliver has Dravet syndrome, which, what makes Dravet unique in the spectrum of epilepsies is it does not respond to the anticonvulsant or anti-epileptic medications. So with that said, what happens is this little guy goes into a state of status epilepticus, which is, you know, where he's seizing and nothing is stopping it. So this is very hard on anyone, let alone a little guy that's one year old. So that status epilepticus and not being able to stop it is um, what makes Dravet different than, you know, just not responding to the anti. Um, epileptic medications. Josh was asked several times throughout you know people at work and everything what can we do what can we do and we were at a loss we didn't know we didn't know what to do you know we were just lost and on struggling. multiple occasions I told people straight up I really I don't know what you can do I yeah. don't know how to ask for anything at this point because I don't know what I need yeah. I don't have I don't have a clue but then again so. then Katie and Amy from Crown they they stepped up and called the Epilepsy Foundation and got the ball rolling for a service dog, which is something that we had thought about because he does have these really long seizures and he may have one at night. We may not catch it and he may not be there when we wake up in the morning as scary as that is to think about. I received an email from a community member in New Bremen, Ohio, and she shared the story of a family that had moved up from Texas and was working with her at Crown Industries. She shared about how they had had a little boy and he has epilepsy and he actually has a more severe form of epilepsy called Dravet syndrome. He was at that time having up to 100 seizures a day. And working with Children's Medical Center here in Dayton, they had suggested that they look into obtaining a seizure dog for Oliver. There's no, there's no real sleep being had in our house. It's, uh, for the longest time it was sleeping in four hour shifts. You would uh, 
you know, try to, well, try to sleep in a four-hour shift. You get just about good and asleep, and then, oh, it's my turn, okay. <laughs> Tag out. One of us always had to be with him throughout the night and throughout the day uh, in case he started to have a seizure so we could try to administer any kind of medication immediately. And get him to the hospital. So that we could, yeah, and, and try to start trying to stop it as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, the goal of getting this seizure dog and helping Oliver um, helps not only Oliver but the family also. So the way the seizure dogs are trained, they can actually sense the seizure before it happens and alert. Um, there are a lot of sleepless nights and it's very stressful in the family. Sometimes they, Oliver will go into a prolonged seizure and so that is the thing that we, are, we try to avoid and he has had to be care flighted to children's four times since we've known the family. So having a seizure dog will actually help Oliver because the, the dogs are trained specifically to sense when a seizure is about to happen. And they are trained to alert the individuals in the family that are the caregivers. And of course in Oliver's situation, that is the parents. So that will help to provide rest for the parents because they know that that dog has been trained. They will hear when Oliver's going to have a seizure like this. Also, the dog provides comfort for the individual. So the dog will provide comfort for Oliver. And it has been, in case studies, it has shown that seizures are diminished when the stress levels are diminished. So that helps to calm the individual and hopefully it will help in finding the plan that works best for Oliver, the seizure dog, will be a tremendous benefit. The community actually came together to bring awareness to their city, their community, and it has extended into the surrounding counties um, by learning about epilepsy, learning about seizure first aid, so that they know how to respond when an individual has a seizure, when Oliver has a seizure, so that they're, they're not afraid of it. Because epilepsy is still one of the most stigmatized conditions that exist. So what, it's our goal, and now that community's goal, to dispel those stigmas. So it's been very exciting to see everyone from children and scout troops to business owners and churches say, how can we find a cure? Let's get involved. We're helping Oliver. Who else needs our help? And so they are educating themselves by coming to us and we're working as a team to make a difference. It's been amazing what Flame Walk has done, one, to help epilepsy, but two, to help Oliver. So we're really, we're really excited. Um, we have 11 counties that we service and that's a little overwhelming for our small affiliate. So with the Flame Walk, we broke those 11 counties into four zones. And we um, will have walks or 5Ks um, in each of those four zones. And Oliver's story has touched the community in such a way that um, a second zone has decided to do a Flame Walk and dedicate funds towards Oliver's seizure dog which has been amazing too. So, you know, we call it the flame walk, ignite the flame. Right now, I feel like we're just, we're on fire and, and we're moving this mission forwards, which just, <laughs> I can't say enough good stuff. It just makes your heart happy and gives you butterflies in your stomach. You are oxygen. On a late night drive To clear my hand When hope has passed me by You are gravity When I'm upside down
Denise, thank you for bringing that. I'm glad we were able to show it to the viewers tonight. A very happy ending to, to that story and a great uh, fundraiser and great education in the community. And it was just last June that that happened. And now he's graduating with the dog. What what has the family done during the year in prep in in preparing for this and incorporating this this dog into their home? Well, of course, they work are working with four parts okay. for abilities, and right. that's quite a long process okay. because there has to be a match, and they have to go through sort of a training university. You know, okay, and they'll all graduate. Right. So, all right, all um, right. We're we're learning about that process, and we'll be part of that graduation, so that we're learning as well and, sure. and documenting. You know, as great. we go. So, um, but we just, you know, we really want to be a catalyst to let people know they're not alone. Right, right. We will find answers. We support you. We're surrounding you. That's good. It's a wonderful help. And the next, uh, the next person is Emily in Miamisburg this summer, right? That will be receiving. Emmeline. Emmeline. Yes. Thank yes. you. Emmeline, yes. who will be receiving um, a, a seizure dog. That's great. Mm -hmm. So people are going to be able to find out about your events on your website. They'll yes. be posted there. So I'd like you to say it again okay. in case somebody wasn't writing down yes. quickly enough. Yes. Please visit our website at www.ohioepilepsy.org and, and you know, sign up to get information and we actually have individual you know for each of the different events we can get you on our mailing list or our email list and we'll send information um, or you can call us by calling 937-233-2500 very good. And if people uh, may not be the best at playing volleyball, can they um, contribute to a team financially or come and watch and pay a, oh, you know, a, a admission fee you know or what? something? We have a very nominal donation okay. that if they want to come and just be a spectator, they right. can do that. Okay. There's lots of fun activities and many people come to, to watch, but also they'll have the teams up online and you know they come together as a group and, and fundraise so yes you can get involved in many different ways uh, you can come and help with the event so a lot of people do that right right mm -hmm. that's great mm -hmm. and then for those who might be able to offer some time helping with office type work they should just contact your yes. office and set up a schedule right that is correct and for those that have not yet uh, found you and need to find you they should just call and you can work with families and schools teachers anyone who approaches you absolutely. individually absolutely yes. is there some part of your work as our time is wrapping up here is there some part of your work that uh, that we have not covered that you would like to highlight well, you know, I think that we are always to being very creative in how we can support our, our community. And so, you know, one of the things that came up this year is our, an art therapy program. And the National Office has actually launched an art therapy program as well. So we are hoping to partner with them this year on that piece. And we're getting a lot of interest for the art therapy program. And so, how, how, might that, how might that look? Well, you know... Um, Art therapy helps people deal with their emotions in so many positive ways. And so we see that art can help the youngest child and the eldest adult. Mm -hmm. So I think that we're very excited about the possibilities that exist in providing this. We will be working with an art a certified art therapist. And we'll basically have art sessions and we'll bring like age groups together to work on art projects and that will be ongoing. So it will provide, you know, really it'll become maybe a support group as well. You know, I think that will evolve out of it, but we're very excited about the possibilities that exist um, through that program. So there are things like that that we are doing, and if you're interested, please give us a call. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Good, good. And again, you cover those 11 counties, so yes. you've got a really wide territory, uh, but you're willing to travel to get out to people yes. and to talk to them and to, to help them yes. uh, with, their, with their needs. Absolutely. And as far as the prescription assistance, they should also call your office. Yes. Are, there are there particular hours for that type of assistance, or anytime all day long anytime we are open nine to five a lot of times we're there a lot later so okay. give us a call but you know even if if an individual calls after hours leaves a message we'll get right back to them because that's of the utmost importance to us to make sure that they stay on their seizure medication okay all right yes because the interruption in the medication is what can cause a, a setback, right? That's right. So that That's kind right. of management. And you all then also will be able to, of course, there's a physician's office, but you all are able to help people with the 
the life practical parts of managing right. that that medication. Right. And do you find that that is a, a challenge for certain members of our population? Is it is it harder for kids? Is it harder for older folks? Is it harder for men or women? Or well, you know, I think there's there's such an adjustment period that we do hear that um, individuals, especially in the teen years, huh. will avoid taking their medication because they don't like the way it makes them feel. We I hear, I, I just want to feel normal. Right. So, you know, we do, we work with families and, and help them to stay consistent with their medication. Right. It, and it's the important, very important thing is that they can, yes, feel normal, right? Yes. Right? They can. <laughs> they can. And, you know, so, <laughs> absolutely. You know, and I think understanding sometimes that you're not alone yes. is, is a key factor in, in feeling good about that, you know, because we want, we, you can be absolutely normal. This does not have to affect your life and I, I think that's that's the key. Okay. Is you want to live well with epilepsy. Well, well put there. Thank you. Well said at the end. So thank you. Thank you very much for coming on the program thank and I'd like to me. thank I'd like to thank the viewers uh, for watching and the callers who who called in. So uh, don't hesitate to contact the Epilepsy Foundation of Western Ohio for um, assistance with a wide variety <laughs> of, of help that they can give. Thank you and good night. Good night.